I remember being a little kid, having little care in the world, only thinking about what crazy pursuit I'm about to have every single day. After school, I would go home just in time to turn on the TV and watch one of my favorite childhood television shows. But I believe Aang can save the world. Avatar The Last Airbender At the time, I had little to no idea what it was. All I ever cared about was how great their bending powers were, how funny their wacky adventures are, and how cool it is to actually be the Avatar. But little did I know that I would still carry my fondness of a mere children's show up to now. I'm not a child anymore, although I act like it more often than not, but Avatar The Last Airbender still feels close to my heart, and I'm certain that I'm not the only one. Since it was first released in 2005, it has garnered a massive fan base from all over the world, altogether admiring the beauty of the television series. And it's not just because of the intense fight scenes, their cool powers, and their crazy adventures. After years and years of watching and re-watching it, more than that you can see how great the entire plot is, how complex each of the characters are, and how profound the lessons it provides us with. For one, one of the things people love the most about Avatar is Prince Zuko's struggle to regain his honor. His was a great and a well thought of story of redemption that lasted for all three of the show's seasons. It even mirrors the profundity of the notion of redemption brought to light by one of the most prominent medieval philosophers, Saint Augustine of Hippo. But before we dive into Zuko's great redemption arc and how it parallels with that of the medieval philosopher, let us first glance through the life and the philosophy of Saint Augustine of Hippo. Born as Aurelius Augustinus on November 13, 354 CE in Tagas, Namibia, or present-day Algeria, Saint Augustine had a humble beginning, living a life mostly of poverty. Despite his father being a landowner, Augustine's family had sometimes struggled to make ends meet. However, they were still able to provide only Augustine a first-class education with which he studied literature, rhetoric, and dialectic first in Tagas, then in Medauros, and lastly in Carthage. After studying, Augustine then established a school in his hometown, where he started a career as a teacher. Following the death of a friend, he then returned to Carthage and continued teaching there instead. It was during this time that Augustine had adopted the teachings of Manichaeism, particular to the notion of perpetual conflict between good and evil, over the teachings of Christianity. But along with his departure from Carthage to Rome and then to Milan, his faith in the Manichaean teachings grew weaker as his doubts on some of its bizarre principles like cosmology grew stronger. Augustine, on the other hand, had come to have faith in Neoplatonism in lieu of Manichaeism. With how similar Neoplatonism is with the teachings of the Bible, Augustine ultimately converted to Christianity. Augustine later returned to his hometown, Tagas, where he would be appointed as the bishop at Hippo despite being criticized as unfit for the role. He would soon write partly as a response to such criticisms one of his most significant works, Confessions. True to its name, Confessions is Augustine's way of both confessing to God how he led a sinful life and also how much his love for him is. Confessions being written largely in an autobiographical manner is what enabled Augustine to illustrate the certain sinfulness that is his life. First, he recalls the very innate selfishness of humans as well as of himself, thereby establishing a much too pessimistic view of human nature. This selfishness can be seen even from infancy as how a certain child cares about nothing but their own needs. This, according to him, is the original sin that initially stops us from remembering our Creator. Such concupiscence disturbs Augustine. He starts to wonder how something so pure and good could be so corrupt and evil. And he first finds his answer in Manichaeism. Something good can be evil because good and evil are equal powers animating the universe and are continuously in conflict and at its center is the human person. Hello. The body, being the embodiment of evil, 
possesses such desires and thus explains such concupiscence. But sooner or later, Augustine comes to view this type of belief as far too superstitious, especially as it concerns astrology as well, that he eventually abandons this belief altogether. Instead, he puts his faith in one that is much more rational, the thinking that the body is not necessarily evil, and that evil is merely contrary to good, and ultimately, contrary to God, for what greater good there is than God. Living a life indulged with concupiscence and false beliefs, Augustine eventually finds himself drowning in a terrible state of restlessness, only to find solace in God. My heart is restless until it rests in thee. The entirety of Augustine's confession can perhaps be encapsulated into these nine words, My heart is restless until it rests in thee. Augustine's Confessions talks of a spiritual unrest that shall only be assuaged in the struggle to find and return to God. This long, arduous path towards God is what redemption meant for Augustine, and it is manifested greatly by the story of Prince Zuko. Hello, Zuko here. Listen. Zuko was born in a time when the world is faced with a hundred-year war, waged entirely by the Fire Nation and the Avatar is nowhere to be found to bring peace and balance in the world. Unlike Augustine, Zuko did not grow up in a struggling family, rather they were actual royalties. His family came from the royal line of Fire Lords, the ruler of the Fire Nation, so everything was practically handed to him as a kid, being the crown prince and all. His destiny however took a new turn when in a war meeting, Prince Zuko spoke out of turn and enraged the Fire Lord at the time, his own father. As a punishment for his subordination, he was forced to fight his father in an Agnikai, a fire duel. Poor Zuko, however, could not possibly fight his own father and begged for his forgiveness. Instead, the Fire Lord saw this as an act of cowardice, burned his face, and banished him from the Fire Nation setting him off on a mission to capture the long-lost avatar, the one thing that could bring back everything he had lost, especially his honor. Prince Zuko, together with his uncle Iroh, spent years and years searching for the avatar, and upon the latter's return, more time trying to capture him. During his quest, Zuko finds himself time and time again troubled with an internal conflict between good and evil, he was starting to lose sight of what it is that he had been trying to regain in the first place, and whose destiny he was trying to fulfill. This is especially seen when Zuko was given a chance to capture the Avatar's bison, or let it go free, and even more when he had to decide whether to help the Avatar himself and go against the Fire Nation, or fight the Avatar and possibly regain whatever kind of honor it will bring him. While Iroh was there to teach Zuko of the things that really matter, the truth about the world and how it needs balance and not power, alas he still chose to fight the Avatar and was able to reclaim his title and return to the Fire Nation. But upon his return, he did not seem fulfilled but rather felt conflicted. He felt as though the destiny he had fulfilled was never his to begin with and that there was no honor in being the crown prince of a nation that wreaks havoc for power. Sooner or later, he realized that he was capable of shaping his own destiny, and that is, to help the Avatar bring balance to the world and usher in a new era of peace and prosperity. Hearing the story of the banished prince, we shall be able to draw certain parallels between Zuko and what Augustine was talking about in his confessions. First is how he too had had an early struggle with concupiscence. Coming from a royal family with a silver spoon in his mouth, it is easy to assume that Prince Zuko always had his way. In fact, his banishment was even due to his own selfishness. If he had not been so stubborn to get what he wanted, which was to go to the war meeting, nor if he had kept quiet and not tried to speak when he was not supposed to, he would not have been banished in the first place. During his years searching and capturing the Avatar, Zuko had also more often than not prioritized his desire to capture the Avatar over the counsel of his uncle 
and the safety of his crewmen. But perhaps the biggest manifestation of this selfishness was when he found himself at the crossroads of his destiny, choosing between helping the Avatar or fighting him, and still chose the latter in hope to regain whatever honor he thought he would obtain. Zuko had also succumbed to false notions of good and evil. Living in a time of war, Zuko's skewed conception of good and evil could very well be indoctrinated since the moment he was born. Being born in the Fire Nation, the nation that primarily started off the Hundred Year War and tipped the whole world out of balance, he was led to believe that only power is good, that only the Fire Nation is good. He became blind to the monstrosity and the destruction the Fire Nation had brought unto the world and how evil they were for it. It is because of this kind of thinking that when Zuko thinks about his honor, he sees only his throne and his return to the Fire Nation. Both concupiscence and a distorted conception of good and evil had also haunted Zuko with restlessness, that he too hoped and sought to find solace somewhere. Augustine searched for his one true faith to relieve his restlessness, but for Zuko, it was his honor. Finding his honor was what kept Zuko going, and only when he truly was able to find it was he able to fully rest. It is how Zuko's redemption arc fully captures the quote, My heart is restless until it rests in thee, that we can see how akin his story is to what Augustine meant by redemption. They both had struggled in ways that are perfectly human as inherent selfishness. They both had struggled in trying to find the answers to their problems. They both may have stumbled along the way, but they ultimately found what they were looking for. Though they may have been looking for different things, the same painful albeit illuminating process of regaining them is the same. Perhaps they may even have been looking for the same thing after all this time. Augustine redeems himself through God, the greatest good there ever is in the world, while Zuko redeems himself by bringing what is good for the world. It is then only through goodness that one can ease the restlessness of their heart. This may be quite a reach, but there's really no harm in trying. Besides, it is possible. And redemption is possible. Augustine and Zuko showed us that. As a kid, I may never have understood all this stuff about redemption, as I too had little to no care in the world back then. But if what Augustine is saying really is true, then I'd like to believe that I still have a shot at redemption. Augustine may have indulged with worldly pleasures a bit too much and followed the false views of Manichaeism. Zuko may have been too privileged as a kid and believed that fascism is good, but they too had found their way in spite of these. What this tells us is that it doesn't matter if you had gone astray. What matters is that you keep finding your way. That is what redemption means.